Hey guys, it's Reenactment Day here with another video. In this video, I'm going to be getting dressed as a um, Battle of the Bulge-ish kind of winter gear. Now, starting off, as you see, I have a long sleeve shirt on, a long sleeve OD shirt on instead of a short sleeve one. That was pretty self-explanatory. Colder weather. Wool pants, still the same. They're wool, they're warm. Everything is the same with the wool uniform but what I'm going to do is I'm going to take another pair of socks and just put them on over the other socks now I'm sitting down mostly because I have to get myself in view instead of just standing and you seeing this the whole time like I'm trying to hide my face but just put another sock on pretty self-explanatory again two pairs of socks are warmer than one pair of socks now, the M37 wool shirt to match with the M37 wool trousers. Now, you know, pretty si just the same shirt as normal. As you've seen in all of my other videos, except for the Pacific War one, they had the HBT. But, again, just a button down shirt and tucks into the pants very fancy this is a dress uniform while it's also a combat uniform I'm probably gonna be looking for an original pair of pants for dress purposes not for combat because dress pants or original pants could get very damaged and they could be very weak because they're 70 years old and you wouldn't want to use those in the field. And use the reproductions. These have sap on them from a reenactment. So I can't, these aren't the best for dress. But next, as you see, standard um, GI belt. For pants reasons, you don't want your pants to fall down in the middle of a battle. You can pick these up probably at a surplus store for about three bucks. They still make them, make decent reproductions. This one's from at the front. But, you got the belt. Pretty much it. Pretty much normal. Now, before I get into everything else, let's put on boots. Standard rough out leather combat boots. Now, these are dubbed. If you get a new pair, these are going to be very light tan and you would need to put dubbing on them, which is kind of like a wax. Put it on, heat it, and well, you heat the boot first, you lightly heat it, then put dubbing on, then you heat it in, then you wipe off the extra. But that, what this does is it preserves the leather, makes the leather last longer, and boots get darker and it makes it waterproof. So we will, I'll put those on and come back when I have these on. Now, next, if the cars are loud out there, I have the window open because this stuff gets very hot. But next, the M1938 leggings. Standard leggings, lace up. I have an old video from a long time ago on how to lace these, but still works. It's still a pretty good video, one of my uh, best early videos. But these just go on your boot, wrap around, back, and then it's a slow process of um, lacing it up. Very slow, but it does look very World War II. Double buck boots are a valid option. They used, um, they, those are most wanted by reenactors because they are easier. You just put the boot on and buckle it. But I choose leggings, even though harder, they look more World War II because they were more common. So lace it up. And I'll come back when I have both of them laced up and on. Alright, now that I have the boots all uh, leggings up and all, just got all the leggings on them, you would take a GI sweater. These are the most common five button sweater. As you see, five buttons. And it actually goes over this wool shirt. So it goes over it. stretches 
very nicely to the shape. It's pretty tight. I'm a little fat, but that's all right. But as you see, sweater, more shirt, and everything. Now you'd want to get many layers on because it is going to be cold. So about there. There's another sweater that is like just a vest, like a vest sweater. So this is kind of normal. Doesn't have the buttons and the arms, no arms. Pretty much the same. Other than that. Next, moving on to the probably the most iconic part of the impression. The big and bulky overcoat. Pretty heavy. It's actually really heavy for a military item. But nonetheless, super warm. Now this coat does fit me very well. It's like it was issued to me be fitting very nicely. Three buttons. Not getting my face in a lot of these just because the angle of my camera. But as we see, just the collar could go all the way down like that or just could kind of fold up like that. But I leave this open and this is how it looks so far. Now I am very warm in this stuff so far because right now I have a long sleeve shirt, the wool shirt on top, the wool sweater on top, and this big bulky wool overcoat. Now as you can tell the army loves wool, mostly because it's a great item to standardize your equipment with. But next moving on to the field equipment, actually no hold on. We will start with a couple other warm items, including a scarf. Very nice, very warm. I like to wrap it around my face, kind of like that. Then it comes around, twist it once. This is just how I'm doing a scarf. Probably better ways, but this is how I do it. That keeps your neck warm as well. Now, moving on to field gear, the lightweight gas mask bag, as normal, I've seen these in a few other of my videos, it would just hold a gas mask, but a lot of GIs would throw away their gas mask and use this for personal items. This bag is a, one of the handiest things on the field. But after that, you got the bandolier holding six M1 cartridges or end blocks. Pretty much just kind of move it over like that. And then your haversack along with your ammo belt on the bottom. And on your ammo belt you have your canteen which real quick I'll just tighten that a little bit just to keep it from flopping around and fasten the water bottle back in. Hold your med kit, you can hold your bayonet like I have it, and your med kit, and your canteen thing. I think I met, said med kit twice, but that's pretty much it. Very hard to get on with this big bulky thing on me. This is why a lot of GIs didn't like this too much, because each a big and bulky you can't really maneuver around in it now I gotta adjust my belt I just realized so I'll come back when I have that adjusted now after you have your old field equipment on all adjusted and all set up to your liking you will take a Jeep cap or a watch cap or whatever you got hold it over your head you know, just, it's a hat. Pretty simple. Again, self-explanatory. And you take your M1 helmet. This is an original M1 helmet I just got from May 1943. 
May or June, 1943. But pretty nice. It's good. And lastly, your gloves. These are trigger finger mittens, as they are known about, or known as. Pretty simple, pretty self-explanatory. And now you are very ready for winter. Now you will see this most of the time, Battle of the Bulge. That is because they did not have another jacket, or their jackets weren't issued because supply lines were still being set up. So they got trapped behind enemy lines wearing these big bulky overcoats and maybe sometimes their summer jackets if they didn't have it for their M41s. But M41s are a good jacket to have in the in the winter. The lined ones, not the summer ones. Now, what's the problem with these overcoats is they tend, they're, they're long, they're big, long, and very he uh, heavy coat. Um, these would get wet in the winter and then freeze, pretty much, and how GIs would describe it is you would be walking around with a piece of plywood on you. So not good for maneuverability, not good for battle. Now, I'm just gonna show you it right now. As you see, pretty good gear. That is the back, right there. Shovel, haversack, all that. All that fancy stuff. Very warm, very nice. Um, you could also have long johns underneath your wool pants, but I do not have them right now. So, this would be your outfit. This would be your rifle. These M1 Garen, but this is a wood one I made. Pretty good for the tools I had though. This is how they would be at the Battle of the Bulge. Now I'm going to get my field gear off again and show you another variant of winter clothing that they would have. All right, so I'm back with, you know, everything off. Just the sweater again. Another variant they would use is either a lined M41 jacket or what I have, an M43 jacket. I just got this today. Very nice, very warm. It's lined, of course. Got these fancy pockets. Nice and fancy. And one thing that I found out that I didn't expect, there are two ropes here and they adjust at the waist. So, never knew that. Never knew that was going to be like that. GS probably didn't do it, so I'm not really gonna bother with it. But it has the option. Now, standard, it's not as fancy as the M41. Uh, it's all buttons, no zipper. So, not as fancy. But it's nice, it's warm. This is the warmer side of the jacket. Like the M41, yeah, it's warm. The lined M41 is warm. This is warmer, so I decided to get this instead. And plus, my unit, Yankee Division, the 26th, um, they weren't in Europe until actually August, so we weren't even there for D-Day. But at D-Day reenactments, we kind of team up with the first. And we just throw on their patches and storm the beach. But um, these jackets, they would be a little bit rarer at that time because these are newer jackets and they take time to make, produce, and ship out to the people. Now the reason I didn't do the internal waist thing to pull this tight is because I'm putting on a belt anyway. But again, go back to it. Scarf. Rope around. You know, just the way I did it before. This is just my way of doing a scarf. Like I said, there's probably other ways that are better, but I am just doing this. Tuck it into here, tuck it into here. One or two, I can, no, I can't, I can't button that up. But, jacket, nonetheless. Then, gas mask bag, over the shoulder, bandolier, over the other shoulder.
I think my bandolier just clipped to my gas mask bag. There's a hook there. I don't know if it did, but if it did, that's gonna be a pain to get off. Half a sack. Oh boy. Adjusting. There. There we go. Just the gas mask bag down a little bit. This comes over and pull it up and through. Like, kind of like that. And just get a couple things adjusted, such as the bag. Oh well, that's good enough for now. That hook is kind of digging in. And I feel like my bandolier did clip to it. Fun. Gonna be a fun time. But, moving on. Hat, normal. Everything else from here is the same. These also button up on the sleeves. I don't know if I showed you. But, um, these tighten up. These can either go under or over. That's really just based on what you prefer. This is more of a combat attire for winter. Here we go. Combat attire. Easier jacket. Doesn't go down as far. Can run around, dive in the ground, and do this more. For battle, for the battle of a bold, battle of the bulge reenactment or something like that you would use the trench coat more likely because that's what was common. But any other winter event that you may have, you'll see reenactors using this because it is easier, simple, and lighter to carry. Though not as warm, it's warm enough. Plus, if you want to, you can take this off um, while I can't put on the trench coat, but when you go into a battle, you take off the trench coat, put on the jacket, which is what a lot of GIs did. So that's it for this video. Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed this video, feel free to like and subscribe. If you have any video ideas or any questions on the gear that I have shown, leave them down in the comments, and I will see you guys later.